we will be taking a presentation at this time from Reverend Monroe Wisdom Jr., our National Teens Ministry Director. And uh, we're going to focus on content and context programming for youths. Content and context programming for our young people. Uh, we want to put our hands together at this time and appreciate, welcome, Reverend Wisdom. Good. It's good afternoon, my fellow ministry workers. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure just to be sharing with you in this session. I believe by now you should be seeing my screen share. And let's not worry about the time that was allotted. I promise to make this very quick but meaningful. And I appreciate you staying on with us to this point. So there has constantly been a cry for the church to be relevant. That is a word that we've heard banded about oftentimes, about the church needing to be relevant, about ministry needing to be relevant, about how, about whether or not the church is relevant. So the question is, what does it mean to be relevant? And just to engage you for a few moments, can, can I have one or two persons just raise your hand? And in the context of ministry and church, you can you explain to me what you think it means to be relevant? Go ahead, Brother Clark. Um, to be relevant, current and impactful. Current and impactful, I like that. I see another Brother Clark, Fitzroy Clark, this time from Montague Bay. Go ahead, Brother Fitzroy Clark. So let's jump over to Sister Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I think being relevant means um, that the church should, should, should be able to see the things that are capturing the mind of the people and use those tools and strategies um, to, to capture their attention in church. What are the things that are influencing our people now? How can we use those um, from a spiritual perspective to grab the attention of those that we need and to keep them too? So that's what I think being relevant is about. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Scott. Um, in the interest of time, I will just go through very quickly those that are in the chat. I see the other hands up there. All right, let's go. Sister Marie Gray, could you just go for a quick second? Yes. Our hand went down. But so let me just go through the those in the in the chat. It says relating to specific needs of others to be relevant is to be relatable up to the time, to the time as young people of this day would say. Um relatable and resilient makes sense for this sir. Um, makes sense for this season for such time as this, understanding the cultural changes and modifying our operations to meet the time, but maintaining the truth of God's word with 5G up to the time and impactful. And I see others going there, keeping abreast um, with young people talk, all of those kind of things. And I think they are very good responses. But, so now when, when we talk about what it means to be relevant, I just want to simplify it by offering four M's of relevance. Methods that make ministry meaningful. When we're talking about being relevant, that's what we're really looking at. Methods that make ministry meaningful. It's not merely using contemporary styles or tapping into popular fads and trends or parroting the culture. That's not what we mean when we talk about being relevant. It's so much more than that. And it's not simply mirroring the use or mirroring or using cultural trends to make the church more or less the same. Because a lot of times, funny enough, what we think makes us relevant surely just makes us followers. Um, it makes us look more like what already exists. So the concept or really underlying being relevant is it's about using the language of the culture to communicate the presence of the kingdom. That's the whole idea behind it, being relevant, using the language of the culture to communicate the presence of the kingdom. So relevance is really about being faithful to both your context and to the content of Christian ministry. And from that point of view, I really want us to understand. I know, so I appreciate that the whole idea of content and context programming is a modern educational or what they would call pedagogical tool that is championed as being revolutionary in these days. But given the fact that what we're doing is the discipleship, the goals and realities of discipleship is more formational and transformational than it is just simply informational. What do I mean by that? While education has a lot to do with conveying relevant information that shapes behavior, discipleship does a little bit more than conveying information. It is 
about formation more, more succinctly. And so, yes, CCP or content and context programming does have a place when it comes to discipleship ministry. However, what we have to understand is that it requires some adaptation because the truth is if what we were looking at was the CCP as it is known, and there are teachers and educators in this room that would be much better suited to do a presentation of this nature than I, than I am. So really what we're doing is adapting it to our context now. And I encourage us to understand youth ministry in this way. When you adapt it to our context, you're understanding youth ministry as cross-cultural missions or really more accurately it's subcultural missions. But you have to have that same kind of missionary mindset when you get into youth ministry, because without that missionary mindset, I could give you fancy ideas today, maybe irrelevant for your particular needs. So think about it. That is how I want to frame what we're doing here, understanding youth ministry as cross-cultural or subcultural missions as we delve into this content and context programming. So three mission concepts for youth ministry. One of the first, and I think the central one to our conversation today is contextualization. What is that? That is the process of adapting the message, methods, and ministry of Christianity to the local culture, language, and context. Goal of contextualization is to make the gospel relevant, understandable, and meaningful people within their own, and in this sense, subculture and social context. Good biblical example of this is found in Acts 17, verses 16 to 34, which, which captures Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. When you read that text, what you realize is that Paul noted the cultural realities of the city. It was, he said, it was full of idols. And then he took a stand in the synagogue and marketplace because he saw that this is the space in which interaction takes place. So he went into the synagogue and the marketplace. And he was also aware of the influential and dominant ideologies that existed in the space. He, he knew that there were Epicureans and Stoic philosophers in the space. He also understood the interest of the people because verse 21 tells you that they spent all their time sharing about something new and telling new things. He also used the, the symbols and the concerns of the people to introduce the gospel had this altar to an unknown God and he said, okay, let me, let me pick him upon this. Let me jump onto this so that I can present Jesus Christ to the unknown God that they ignore. That's the unknown God they ignorantly worship. And then Paul does something that would probably cause trouble in some of our context today. Paul then quotes in verse 28 from the poets of their day when he says, in him that we live, move and have our being. Paul was there quoting poets of the day. That is almost like a pastor going up into the pulpit and quoting an influence or a dancehall artist in the middle of his sermon. But what he was doing, it was not just for clout or for popularity. What he was doing was saying, there are these concepts and these understandings. Here is the truth behind them. So that's contextualization. The idea is you have to be faithful to the situation that you are in if you're really going to do Christian ministry to youth. Next, the next concept that we have to appreciate is one called incarnation. Now, this means, this is what Alan Hurst puts it as, this means getting close, moving into their space and getting a real and abiding presence among the group. So incarnation is, the goal is to be a redeeming presence by embodying the gospel in their space. And when we think about youth ministry, a lot is not about, a more is taught in youth ministry than which is taught. In other words, youth ministry cannot be done from a safe distance. We cannot withdraw our normal spaces and places and feel like we're going to have an impact. We have to get up close and personal, very relational. This idea of incarnation is seen in God's ministry to us. John 1 14 tells us that Jesus came and he tabernacled with us. He dwelt with us. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, where Paul says, I've become all things to all people, to the Jews I became a Jews, to those not under the law as one not under the law, to the weak I became weak, so that I may win some. It is not about being the same as, but it is being present with. It is immersing yourself in the culture. Again, youth ministry is life, it, it's life changing because you're going to really have to step outside of your normal space into the youth subculture. 
And then First Thessalonians 1 5, if you read Acts 17, it tells you to drop to this. First Thessalonians 1 5 tells us about Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica. It's a fledgling church, and because of persecution, Paul had to flee. But he was encouraging them to be faithful to the gospel. And Paul tells them that our, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and the and, 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 and the Holy Spirit. And he says importantly, and you knew what manner of men we were among you. In other words, you can what we're offering you is something real and genuine, something that is beneficial, not just because they are good words, not just because you saw signs and wonders. So you saw the kind of people we are is very, very important to today's day. And the last concept that I want to introduce, and this kind of frames it, once we get these concepts, it is much easier for me to just move through this presentation. The last one is syncretism. And this is something to be avoided. It is the replacement of core important truth of the gospel with non-Christian elements. So when you think about what our goal is, that syncretism really is in type with no substance or being seeker friendly, whatever the people want. Being syncretism is about being worldly and devoid of standards. It's about mixing up the holy and the profane. But that is not the goal of the ministry to youth. It's about faithfully representing Christ in your milieu, in your social context, without compromising the gospel truth. Can I say this without fear of backlash? Not a 15 year old teen should be expected to look and act differently when, from another 15-year-old when they are Christian. So again, 15-year-old Christian teen should not look and act like a 15-year-old unsafe teen. But at the same time, a 15-year-old teenage Christian should not look and act like a 50-year-old deacon. And I say that without apologies. So that is to diminish the beauty of the gospel's redemptive power. The idea is not trying to get them to act and look like you, but to get them to and be Christian in their social context so that we can see the universal scope and power of the gospel. So they're going to look and sound a little different, but that shouldn't put you off. Because what where we see, where we see the Bible talking against syncretism is in places like Galatians 3, 1 to 5. The Judaizers they're saying you need to keep all of these laws and all of these traditions. And Paul's response was he was hard to the Galatian believers who has bewitched you. Being begun in the spirit, are you now complete by the works of the flesh? Are you going to allow simple, empty traditions and methods to bog you down instead of moving on to, the, to what God has started in you? Um, it seems that we've forgotten the lesson of Acts 15, where many times what the Jews were doing when the gospel was going to the Gentiles was saying, no, they have to look like us. And Paul and Peter were talking to them and said, let's calm down for a second here. When the council met, James leading that council, they said, all right, we heard this. We see that what God is doing is real. We see lives are being transformed there. So let us not try to make this onerous by trying to make Gentiles look like Jews. We see it fit. We and the Holy Spirit, that is how they put it. See it fit, add no greater burden that, than this to you. And you avoid eating meats offered to idols. So you come out of your cultural mix-up. Avoid sexual immorality and some of these kind of things. So he says, don't bother with all of the traditions. That's not what we're trying to get you into. What we're trying to get you is into biblical and christian faithfulness so we're avoiding syncretism we're not getting our young people to mix up in worldliness but at the same time we're not trying to get the church of 2024 to look like the church of 1994 that that is something we must be very clear about um so context is key. you have to exegete your context when you are when you are doing youth ministry some of the important contextual factors are the developmental context you have children, teens. This word is probably new to most of us, emerging adults. And you have young adults. So something I see that happens very often, and I understand why some people do it, it's conflating age groups, meaning that you put the children and the teens together. I've been invited to be a part of children's and teens convention. And sometimes I understand the reality of your church is that you don't have many children and many teens. And so when you want to keep a convention, you kind of have to put them together. The truth is, you ask yourself, look at children alone. The developmental gap between children is so wide that if you try to meet all the needs of a six-year-old with a 12-year-old, it becomes so hard. Somebody who can barely read to somebody who is now engaged in abstract thinking. And then now you jump all the way over to teenagers who already feel too big to be children are at a different developmental stage. 
all of these things can, if we're not aware of the developmental context for people, then it can be challenging. So sometimes the truth is, so I know that we want to keep certain structures and programs in place. You have to assess your demographic and say, what are the best programs to reach this kind of demographic? There is, um, when you think about teenagers, teenagers are in the peer-oriented group identity, social comparison, conforming to pillar values, identity exploration stage of their development, questioning life, developing their own values and their own morals, they're asking why and challenging everything. It's not rude them rude, but that's where they are. So you have to appreciate that to say, this is where they are in their life development. So if I'm going to form them, I have to form them with that in mind. Um, the next one is that emerging adults. Now, this is something new to most people. There, there's this concept, and I think persons like Jeffrey Arnett um, are pioneers behind this, that suggests that between 18 to 25, and some people even move it up to 30 in some countries, is a different life stage. It is characterized by acronym SIP, S-I-I-P. It says that they are self-focused individuals who feel like they're in between adulthood and adolescence. So that's why you hear sometimes your early 20s feeling like they're not really fully grown up yet. You know, them, they, and some of them still kind of in their parents' house. So you even struggle to see them as fully adult. And the, the possibilities are endless and they're unstable because they're kind of in the entry-level job, but they're not in them final form job. And so you, you find them at this different stage. And some of them are about to think about permanent relationships, getting married, etc. So you to find them in this kind of stage. And that is something that you have to really tap into because statistically, this group is the group with the highest attrition from church. They're the groups that are leaving church. And then we have things like our young adults. So understand developmental context. You have to also understand the socio-cultural context. The generation that we're dealing with now is Gen Z. And sad to say, brothers and sisters, many of us are still just catching up with what it means to disciple millennial young people when Gen Zs are turning 28 and them kind of numbers this year, from 97 to now, yes, 27 this year, 28 by the end of our next church year. That is how old Gen Z people are. I was still just touching up with millennial ministry when millennials are 43 in the oldest age group and 28 in the youngest age group. So what, what has happened is that we've missed a whole generation. You think about Gen Z, Gen Z embrace change, them love change. They are more open to diverse views. They are more socially and politically conscious. So they have all these social justice concerns and they are engaged in, they're, they're what they call digital natives. They're born with social media at their fingertips. That's all they grew up knowing. They're globally influenced persons. So if you listen to a lot of Gen Zs, look and dress and sound and act more like, American than Jamaican. Can't tell the last time a real Jamaican talk really developed recently. What we find is a lot of Americanization here because they're actual global citizens. So their values are not so much influenced by the person next door to them as the influencer on TikTok hundreds of miles away from them. They're also postmodern, so they're stickal, they're questioning absolute truth, them talk about relativisms pluralism, everybody deconstructing that they're not with the status quo, telling them because I said so and that social institutions matter. All of that get is, is, is outside of their, their, their thinking. They're not really off here with those kind of things. So we have to be aware of these things when we're going to the persons. We're exegeting the context. And apologies, I do have to be moving quickly because time is upon us. Um, you have to understand your theological context. We're in what they call a religiously amorphous age. People, just, religion just look all sorts of ways, just look different. There's a whole rise of new age spirituality. And a lot of times we're going to young people because their parents are Christians. And we're talking to them about Bible stories and things like that. Thinking in our minds that these people understand what we're talking about, but they're largely unchurched. They spend their soul, their interaction with Bible and scriptural content and just their presence at church because look at your Sunday schools. If, if your children's Sunday school class are little and your teen Sunday school class are little, where are these people learning the Bible stories? Them at extra lessons and so, so it's not really that them learning them in them homes. They're really just not learning them. And so that is what we're finding. This is the theological context that we're operating in, a context of biblical illiteracy. And then we, we're jumping into the geographical and local context because what work up Walton Park would necessarily work in a rural church and what works in 
um, a suburban church, a church in a nice little area that is not too town and not too country. So for all the people who are from Kingston, let me let me enlighten you that not everything past Ferry is bush. You have some places that are developed beyond those places. But they're not urban, urban, but they're not rural. So what is the context looking like? Is it an inner city context that you're working in? Um, is your church remote, meaning that it's hard for people to get to your church or do people live in walking distance? All of these things matter when you're thinking about your youth programming. So let me move all of that from this theoretical thing now into very practical considerations about context in youth programming. One, consider your meeting times, your meeting frequencies, and your location. So what time am I going to meet? Can people make it out this time? I came to Kingston, and because I wasn't always from Kingston, I recognized our meeting time for our teenagers was a Friday evening. But it was problematic because to get from Halfway Tree to Manning's Hill Road on a Friday evening was a problem. Traffic would kill you. And then the, we would start late and then the teenagers would have to go home late and some of them don't live in the safest communities. So you know what we had to do? We had to say, all right, Friday evenings is, is a no-go despite how it's traditionally done. So let's move it to Saturday afternoons. And we have to factor in like when extra classes would start, when extra classes would done, when parents would likely come into the town. So those are things that you consider in your context. The frequency of your meetings, the location that you're going to be meeting. Am I going to be meeting every week? Am I going to be meeting every other week? Am I going to be doing online one week and offline the other week? Um, what does this space that I'm meeting in look like? Because sometimes we meet in the church house and the church has chairs and we have them sitting in rows and it affects how they think and how they feel. It feels a little structured and, and cooped up. Other things, promotion and engagement. Like this no flyer thing won't fly in this modern age. If you want people to come out because so many things are happening around, you have to kind, kind of promote. So we need to make sure that you understand no flyer won't fly. How are you going to promote? Just church announcements? Are you going to be sending what blast? Are you going to be using a group? Like, do you have to liaise with parents? Do you have to liaise with people in the community because you're trying to get people from the community to come out? Resources do you have? Technological resources, financial resources, infrastructural resources. What are the things that I have at my disposal to the youth ministry? For example, I heard one brother speak earlier today about wanting to start a football competition, recognizing poor church and financially poor, that's what I mean, and you don't have a whole heap of people and you're trying to partner with other persons. Sometimes it's not necessarily just sourcing the people internally, but saying, all right, people in the community play football. We don't necessarily have to find all the teams. We can identify the field. We can do the organization of the competition, meaning we identify the field. We are the ones that are administrating the competition. We talk to two persons to sponsor it, and it's a community competition. We run some things through church. You have to, we have to start thinking like that. So I'm not say, I'm not dismissing your idea. I'm just saying that is the way we start to think. What is the context? What do I have available? Human resources. Who are the persons that I have interacting with and working alongside my teenagers? Who are the persons that I have interacting with my children? Do I have enough persons to do these this many ministries? What am I focusing on? All of those things. Group sizes. For example, some person say, well, I can't have this ministry because I have only a few persons in my church. Let me draw a little bit on my teens ministry experience. I remember talking to somebody and they said, we had four or five teenagers in our church, so it's hard to do teens ministry. And I said, I appreciate that. It's hard to have a teens ministry program and plan a program for five persons and then three of them don't come out and it's two per persons. So sometimes you have to recognize that since this context is not for big group programming, it's a small group, sometimes it's just about inviting the teenagers to come live one day and come on a Saturday and want to talk about some things, on a meeting up for a few moments after church on a Sunday to do something, something is happening and you're carrying them out. So sometimes that is what your ministry is going to look like. It's not necessarily going to look like a big children's ministry in a, in a, in a room around the back because... We have a truckload of children. Sometimes it's about just engaging one and two children in a very small group, mentoring, discipleship type of atmosphere instead of your traditional programs. You have to create an experience. This is about postmodern. They don't just want information. They want an experience. Look at the worship music that is popular nowadays. Is music. Everybody's starting to look like the maverick, spontaneous thing. Even our traditional people. Look how Israel reinvent himself to start looking like that. Because people, aren't, people want to feel like it's free flowing and it's an experience. So create the kind of experience is not just about what you are doing as a program, but you have to ask yourself, what is this experience going to be like? Yeah. So 
as a youth minister, one of the things that you have to ask yourself, there are three questions every youth minister really asks themselves every week. What can we do that is fun? What can we do that is different? What can we do that is free? Saw this on, on, on an Instagram site and I said, you know, it is so, I, I didn't recognize it was so universal. Those are questions you're always asking yourself. Because another thing about your programs, be dialogical. Make sure that there's back and forth communication, not just dogmatic in terms of handing out information. And something I think our churches need to get is that initiatives are greater than activities. So, for example, you want to develop good fasting habits among your young people at your church. So you say, guess what you're going to do? You're going to keep a youth fasting service. Yes, so we keep a youth fasting service. Good initiative. Good starting point. They come to this one fasting service because they're not going to the regular fasting service. And then what happens after that? Do they continue fasting? Um, so maybe then what you need is not so much just a one fasting service to develop the kind of thing that you want. But in your context, you're saying, how best can I carry this across? Um, maybe what I need to do is I create a fasting challenge, a fasting initiative. There's a 30-day fasting challenge. These are you not going to eat. These are your per points. People do those things all the time. Them posting this today, posting that tomorrow. Can you tweet that and use that now to develop a discipline? Because the idea is not just to do a one-off thing for program's sake. It is an initiative to build towards what you're doing. Consider their interests. Like Reverend Pete said, there's nothing going to get 3 billion people into a space like sports. What are the people you're trying to reach interested in? How can I leverage it? Be like Paul. What the meeting and chatting about religion? Let's find a way to piggyback on that. They like to create content. Let us find a way to piggyback on that. Like dancing, let's find a way to piggyback on that. Oh, they like dancing. So do we just have dance practice? No. There's a dance group with dance practice, but there's also prayer meeting. There's also Bible studies. There are also different things that you use. This is a meeting point and you leverage those interests. And consider a delivery format. Am I going to have a presenter, a rap session? Is it going to be a competition? Are they going to be creating something? All right, these people are talented. Am I going to just tell them about using their talents? Uh, or am I going to create a space where they can use their talents? And after we get that kind of context, and context is key, we have to recognize that content is king. So you have to exegete the text. We have to understand that biblical faithfulness is important so when i talk about exegeting the text um there's this idea that came to us that sometimes we feel like the message is the same yesterday today and forevermore and so the same message that i preached in 1980 i'll preach it in 2020 and it will still have the effect which is the same gospel but can i tell you that perspective and vantage point matters emphasis matters let me use it this way let me use this example there are several countries that speak english in the world you can tell an American different from a in, than from a UK resident different from an Australian. Why? Because sense matter, emphasis matters, intonation matters, nuancing matters, and so there. I'm using that three. There are three atonement the theology models, and I'm not here to jump into the depth and the accuracy and which should be preferred among both the other. But let me just give you a quick run through of what they are. They, they have this recapitulation model. The idea is that. Jesus came and he reversed the work of sin in our lives. So all the damage that sin has done to us, he has reversed it. So he died the death and reversed the work of sin. He has taken our brokenness and our shame. So the first man, Adam, he's the second man, Adam. And so all the corruption that Adam put in us, Jesus, through the work of the cross, removes the corruption from us. So the central focus on this is not that there's punishment for the sin that we did, but it is that it, the, the central focus is on the effects that the redemptive work has on us, how Jesus cleans us up and transforms us. Then you have the Christus Victor model, this idea that Jesus came to conquer and break the works of Satan, destroy the works of the enemy, bring breakthrough, deliverance, and victory. He came to ransom you from the prison of sin. And then you have the penal substitution method, method, method that's our uh, model rather, that says, Jesus came and he satisfies God's wrath on the cross because God was upset with sin and sin must be punished. And so he satisfies his wrath on the cross. And then you ask, which of these three is the gospel? And in a very real way, all three of them is the gospel because we have to understand that the gospel is a consistent yet multifaceted method, message rather. So what the emphasis was 10 years ago is not necessarily the emphasis today. When I show you a very real thing when it comes to young people and trying to reach young people, you will hear somebody in a crusade preaching and say, can you imagine the life that some of them people live? 
six man them have one today, one tomorrow, one the other day. Nasty. God wants to clean up your nasty lifestyle. You see, when you resonate with young people, guess why? Because them singing song by Tinashe, I'm a nasty girl, nasty, nasty. Girl. Them calling themselves nasty. Them celebrating it. You need to hear stock actually kind of explicit lyrics. So the thing that you are telling them, you need to see it from this. These things they are embracing. Then think about something else about them. Young people are anxious. They're questioning their identity. They're feeling broken and insufficient. Why do you think like songs like Jaira are so popular in worship? Not just among Christian young people, but everybody. You are enough. I'll be content. You know, it wasn't holding you up, so nothing I can do to let you down. Because in this social media driven age of comparison and people telling you you need to hustle harder and grow, people feel inadequate, insufficient, unloved, feel like them. They just don't match up and measure up. And when you present Jesus Christ as an all-loving God who gives you grace and cares about you, despite what you've done, you are actually speaking into their brokenness. So what you're doing is you're appreciating their context and you're giving a message to the context. You have to appreciate something about the gospel. The gospel is good news. And so the idea is to, is, is, is this is who Jesus is in your context. That's what we're doing. Jesus preached to people. So when he came, in a Jewish context, he used things like, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The message of the gospel through that kind of analogy. So we must consider the issues and speak truth about the text in the specific context that we are called to speak into. And discover the benefit of redemptive analogy in our youth programming. I want us to get this very clearly. When we talk about the message, sometimes when we say the same old message, we have to recognize that we have to be prepared to nuance the same old message. There is this story that Don Richardson talks about the Sawi tribe, and I won't get into all the details for time, but it's this tribe in Indonesia, essentially, that didn't hear the gospel, and he told them the gospel story, and because of their culture and their understanding, when he told them the gospel story, they thought that Judas was the hero of the gospel because they valued treachery. Turning your parents was a rite of passage. So Judas seemed like the hero, and Jesus seemed like the idiot. But when they were in the brink of war, they had this thing called a peace child exchange where each warring faction, the leader would give their child to the other to be raised. And so they, that was an off, like an offering to settle the dispute. And using that kind of imagery, he was able to get the gospel to penetrate the culture. What am I saying? We have to appreciate the culture and the way people are thinking so that we know what Jesus is saying to this generation. It's practical considerations about your content. First and foremost, be biblically sound without compromise. If it's not Bible, then we don't we don't advance it. We're not take it just because it sounds good, just because it might look good, just because it's pop psychology, we don't advance it. If it is not Bible, don't push empty traditions in place of the gospel. Let us not try to recreate an old church. Let us not try to make it look like it looked before in the name of being faithful to the gospel. That's not the goal. I want you to understand something that the messenger matters. Sometimes we think, oh, it's about the message, not about the messenger. Remember that, remember First Thessalonians 1 5, and you knew what manner of men we were among you? The messenger matters. If you develop trust among your young people, then when you speak, they will understand where it is coming from. In fact, a survey among Gen Z persons, when they ask what is the most important quality in leaders, people would think competence and skill. No, they said integrity and authenticity. That was what mattered most in getting them to listen and to bend. Be clear on why you are addressing an issue and what you mean to say about the issue. So you have to know what issues you are addressing. It is not just speaking to a vacuum. You have to know what are the issues. Why am I dealing with this particular issue? And what do I want to say? So some suggested issues or themes for youth programming. Let me run through them quickly character of God, the gospel, and the Bible. God as a loving God, God as a merciful God, God as a just God. What does the gospel actually mean? To enlighten Bible, Bible literacy, holiness and sin. What is sin? What is holiness? Can we be perfect? How far are we from sin? Does moral goodness alone matter? Sex, love and relationship. What is lust? How far can I go? Those kind of things that you're, you're dealing with, purpose and decision making. Why were you created? How can you find your purpose? How can you make good decisions? How can I know God is speaking to me? How can I hear the voice of God? For my identity and belonging. For my, how do I fit into the world? All of those things. 
culture, social media, music, movies, events. How do these things affect my Christianity? Mental health. Why am I feeling anxious? Can Christians suffer from anxiety? Doesn't the Bible say be not anxious for anything? How can I deal with these kind of things? Rejection, trauma, and abuse. How do I deal with all of these issues? And, and so there are a plethora of other issues that we, we can deal with. Ministry and missions. What is my purpose in the church? What should I be doing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Um, so be clear on why you are addressing an issue and what you want to say about it. And then develop a database of frequently asked questions and appropriate responses. Because if, somebody, if you're in a youth ministry, somebody must ask you why tattoo is a sin. And so when you go and answer those kind of questions, make sure that you are not glib and superficial and they're not, you're not taken off guard. You're dealing with these issues. These are the issues that are affecting people. Make sure you have a data. When one of these questions, don't just take an easy answer just because I'm it to be this. Appreciate it and embrace nuance. Don't be superficial or reductionist. No, the Bible says so. Some grew up and know it. And why are we trying to change it now? There are whole heap things that you we grew up knowing that we had to change. Because you, one time we used to sing in church, I got you can't go to heaven with iron here. And no cream here in our church. No, we, we had to change some of these things. We have to make sure that we are biblically faithful and we are not glib. So that really brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, and I hope if you have any questions, I'd be open to answering them now. But that really is about content and context programming. Exegete your context, exegete your content, be faithful to your context, be faithful to your content, the word of God, and make sure that you bring them together in a way that is meaningful and that speaks to this age and this generation. Um, I hope that that was in some way informative and kind of gave us not only practical guidelines and issues that we can tackle, but give us a framework as to how we think about youth programming in this day and age. God bless. Thank you very much, Reverend Wisdom, for the presentation. Let's take uh, one or two questions, and then we will ask Reverend Dermain Rose to pray the closing prayer, and Reverend Page will um, please indicate. If you have a question, you can raise your hand, or you can type the question in the chat, please. There is a question. Do you see syncretism in gospel music today in fact there was this big holy flames controversy recently do i see syncretism in gospel music yes but i have to be very clear about what syncretism is the fact that i know that there are some people who don't like gospel dance all at all because they said this genre is just not very christian it sounds too much like the world but then at the same time them like the petrarchy and those kind of people the mental beat which my mother was called was telling me that when she was growing up that was rag music so it's not the genre that is the problem that causes it to be syncretism. I think the issues are when we start to conflate. Like the Holy Flames controversy, they were taking the very same routine from a, a song I won't name here and dropping it on a Prince Edge song. Um, and you have other persons who take the very rhythm and they don't even tweak it, but they're using the very same melody just to write on the type. How do I see it as syncretism? I see it as syncretism from kind of like... 16 when the little girl was walking behind the men and said these men are servants of the most high god so this was an ephesian sorcerer little girl who was pointing out and associating herself with the christian paul and the miraculous work so what would happen there is that there would be a close association in the minds of the people of ephesus saying that jesus christ is associated with the same kind of witchcraft without any real separation. So we have to appreciate it's a nuanced issue that is not always clear cut, but the important thing is so that we don't have association that says the two are one and the same or the same kind, this different sides of the same coin. We can use the language or the beat or the genre. We have to make sure that the message and the way it is presented and, and what we use to present it are distinct and different so that we're not sending a subliminal message to our young people. What they're seeing out there is the best and is something that they must embrace. So I'd have to really have much more time to dive into the nuance of syncretism in kind of music and other genres. So that is my simplistic answer, as simplistic as I could be in this time. Um, if there's one more question I think I'd... Well, so... Since there seem to be no other questions for me, then I guess my last thing to do is just to say thank you and God bless you. I see will the presentation be shared? I and mean, all that is in the presentation is really on the YouTube, not on the slides. Anything else, it would be something that I would have to speak and communicate. 
So you can please go to the YouTube page and you'll find the presentation there. And when you find it there, please remember to like, subscribe and share. God bless you.